uh, so effective and efficient communication. I have used the words effective and efficient earlier, but let me uh, tell you what they mean again in this context. So the word effective means that I achieve the goal of my communication. So I have some idea which I want to communicate and you get the same idea that I want to communicate that is there in my mind through my communication. So if I am able to reach you, reach my idea to you correctly, then I say I am being effective. Efficient. So, efficiency has, uh, has to do with the effort that I take to communicate my idea. So, I may use a, uh, many words to communicate my idea and on the other hand, I could use a few, uh, fewer number of words to communicate my idea. So, if I am able to do with least effort, least number of words, then I say my communication is efficient. So, we need to look at both these dimensions of communication, effectiveness and efficiency. So, from this point of view, we must look at the communication. So, uh, outline of the contents of this part of the talk are modes and dimensions of communication, oral communication, written communication and some prescriptions for developing communication skills. So, uh, styles of communication, uh, broadly we talk about three styles, formal, informal and casual. So, for instance, uh, a teacher teaching in the class, teacher is being formal or uh, a researcher making a presentation in a conference, it is a formal presentation. Now, teacher speaking to the students in the class about uh, some of the interests that uh, the students may have, their hobbies and so on. Maybe the students and the teacher attended some cultural function the previous day and the teacher is talking to the student about the function and so on. So, here the setting will be informal. Normally, in formal settings, the distance between the person who is communicating and the audience or the person, people who are listening, uh, this distance will be longer. Whereas, in an informal communication, normally the distance is small. So, you are trying to make closer contact with the person in an informal communication. Now, uh, often at least uh, the students have difficulty distinguishing between informal and casual communication. So, many times students want to be informal while uh, communicating with their teachers, but end up being casual. Okay? So, what is the difference between informal and casual? Now, this is something, this question I will leave it to you. At the end of this session, I will ask some responses. What do you think are the differences between informal and casual communication? Please illustrate with some example, right? So, you take an example and uh, tell us uh, that why do you think a particular communication is casual and not informal? Okay. Let me move on to the next mode of communication, uh, modes of communication, namely vertical and horizontal. So, normally vertical communication is between boss and his subordinate. So, where there is a hierarchical difference between the people between which a communication is happening, then we say it is vertical. On the other hand, communication between people of the same status, uh, we call it as horizontal. Then dimensions of communication. So, there are uh, four dimensions, two I have mentioned already, effectiveness and efficiency, which are primarily important dimensions, which I am going to focus on. Uh, but there are other dimensions such as understanding and agreement. So, uh, let me give examples to illustrate uh, some of the ideas. Here is an example of ineffective communication. So, this is an email sent by a student who completed MS program, right? MS is a, a, a master's degree by research. Now, this is the email uh, the student sent to the guide. Sir, my employer wants a letter about the completion of my thesis written by you. Now, what does this uh, mean? Was the thesis written by the guide? Because that is what this seems to indicate. Uh, a letter from the guide about the completion of my thesis written by you. Okay? So, this is an example of ineffective communication. So, you see grammatically you cannot find fault, but it is not communicating correctly. The fact that 
the person wants a letter from the guide about some thesis okay which the student has submitted earlier so again i will leave it as an assignment to rearrange the words so that it communicates this information correctly so probably you could say that sir my employer wants a letter about my thesis about the completion of my thesis right now the letter is to be written by the guide not the thesis right so my employer wants a letter from you or a letter written by you about the completion of my thesis so you have to rearrange these words now very often uh, most of our communication is ineffective because we do not arrange the words properly now what is required for an effective communication now here is an example uh, i will not uh, read this out because it's a relatively long uh, paragraph normally slides should not contain this much text but this is an exception because i have to put a, the complete information on this slide so i will give you a couple of minutes to uh, read this letter which was written by a person named okil chandra sain here at the bottom of the slide the name is given to saheb ganj divisional railway office and it's um, according to the information that i have this letter was responsible for introduction of toilets in trains okay it was written in 1909 so please uh, read this language of this letter and then i will make some comments okay now uh, if you read the language of this it's uh, very humorous um, if you read the language definitely uh, it doesn't confirm to uh, what we uh, normally uh, understand by english language right so what you find is this person is a bengali who thinks in his own language but he has tried his best to transliterate whatever he has felt in english now the point i want to make here is even though the language looks so bad um, in the sense the construction of the sentences the words that are used the transliteration of some indian uh, language but still it is an effective communication as you can see the effect it has had uh, in fact uh, this was responsible for introduction of toilets in trains because the person has vividly described his difficulty though the language is not uh, really sophisticated but still the communication is effective the point i want to make is it is not the sophistication of the language that is required for being effective in communication okay it is a manner in which you express an idea now let us look at the dimension of efficiency what is it that makes uh, communication efficient or inefficient so uh, here in the left hand side column i have indicated the number of words which are commonly used by many while writing papers and so on and to the right uh, in the column to the right i have given a simple equivalent of this number of words which are on the left so for example a considerable amount of this phrase can be replaced by the word much so much means the same as a considerable amount of instead of saying the given data you can say data instead of saying in the event that you can simply say if deposited precipitate well all precipitates are deposited so you don't have to say deposited precipitate it is redundancy you just say precipitate instead of saying the nature of hoyle's work is always of a provocative kind you can say hoyle's work is always provocative this is a much shorter sentence communicating the same idea so now this is how our communication can be made efficient in fact our research has shown that uh, when a student who is not well versed in communication writes his or her first journal paper a experienced uh, writer can reduce this paper to almost 40% of its original size by proper choice of words in fact when i was doing this course in uh, nit jalandhar uh, some years ago uh, there was one experienced teacher sitting there and after my presentation on communication skills he went back to his first paper that he had written and uh, next day he came and said sir actually i applied uh, many of these ideas and i found that uh, after so many years i never uh, bothered to check this that my first paper i could have reduced to 50% of its size okay so 
by proper choice of words, we can improve the efficiency of our communication, both oral and written. Pascal, uh, you know, was a great scientist. He was writing a letter, and this is what was his first line in one of the letters. He said, "I am writing a long letter since I do not have the time to write a shorter one." So the point is, in order to make your communication efficient, you have to put in effort. It takes a time. If you want to make a 20-minute presentation effectively and uh, efficiently, then you have to spend a lot of time in making it, uh, preparing a 20-minute presentation. On the other hand, the amount of effort that you will need to take to uh, make a one-hour presentation will be less than the amount of time you will take to make a 20-minute presentation. So, whenever you want to communicate an idea in uh, least amount of effort, you will have to spend a considerable amount of effort in making the uh, communication efficient. Okay? So, that is why uh, writing uh, shorter papers in uh, letters journals like today you have uh, what are called uh, letter papers, right? papers which are called letters. These are uh, mainly three or four page papers and uh, they take much longer to write than a full length paper which may be uh, eight, eight pages because you have to express the idea in a compact form. Now, communication, it is important to note that communication is for others. So, whenever you write, you please know that it is for others. So, others should understand what you want to say. And improvement in communication improves the quality of learning process and interpersonal relations. So, uh, this is really important. Now, let me uh, discuss a few points about oral communication. We uh, had some um, presentations in the morning. And then we got some feedback, like people said that you know a particular communication was effect clear and uh, things like that. So uh, it is important for us to know that what are the factors which go into making a an oral communication effective. Now this is some very interesting piece of research, um, which we may find uh, a little bit surprising in the beginning, but if we take the results of this research, then we will be able to improve our communication, oral communication. Now, this research shows that 55 percent of the impact that is made in oral communication is because of non-verbal factors, namely gesture and facial expression. So, eye contact and uh, looking at the audience and your facial expression. So, if you look very serious, then that can reduce the impact. Okay? So, if your face, facial expression is relaxed and pleasing, it can make tremendous impact on the audience. Similarly, gestures. Now, for instance, uh, if I am sitting the way I am right now and I am not able to do any gestures with hands and so on, then I am reducing the impact of my uh, communication. Okay? Now, this is one of the reasons why, I mean, if you stand up and then communicate, you tend to be a better communicator. Okay, so, since I am sitting down because uh, this is a long day and several hours of uh, speaking uh, in the standing position can be tiring, but otherwise it is a good idea to stand up and communicate. Then after gesture and facial expression, the next important component that decides your impact in oral communication are factors that go by the term vocal. So, these include uh, spoken words, uh, sorry, uh, pauses, stress and intonation, not the spoken words, the words themselves are only 7 percent. Okay? So, verbal is 38 plus 7, of which only 7 percent is for the words that you choose in communication. That is amazingly a small percentage. Okay? So, if you spend lot of time in perfecting your language, that does not necessarily improve oral communication. Yes, it might uh, improve the effectiveness of written communication, but oral communication, what is more important is whether and where do you pause, where do you stress and whether you modulate your voice. So, stress, pause and intonation is, these are very, very important and they have 38 percent uh, contribution in the effectiveness of the presentation. Now, in fact, uh, again giving the uh, example of uh, NIT Jalandhar, where I made 
this uh, uh, where I taught this course, one a teacher who was uh, teaching for 5 years in that institute came to me and said that sir uh, all this theory that you talk about is good, but it does not work in practice. For instance, he said that uh, he has been spending a lot of time in uh, rehearsing his ideas and so on, but he always gets a poor feedback from the students. So, over 5 years even though he has uh, spent lot of effort in improving his teaching, he feels he has spent lot of effort, but uh, student feedback has not changed. So, in according to him uh, it is not clear what is it that makes impact and uh, all these ideas are uh, theoretical and may not have uh, any practical significance. Now, he spoke only a few sentences uh, to me and then I could recognize from the way he spoke where is the problem, though he could not recognize. So, all of us uh, it is not very easy to uh, recognize our faults. So, we must take the help of others particularly in matters of communication to improve our own communication. So, in this case for instance, uh, the problem was the particular teacher had a very heavy uh, accent of his own mother tongue on the English language that he is he was speaking. So, for instance, uh, this person happened to be a Bengali and his accent had a very strong Bengali, uh, uh, his uh, speech has a very strong Bengali accent. So, it was very difficult for people in uh, Jalandhar in Punjab to understand what he was talking about. So, if I were to now place this problem in this context of the slide that I have shown, the problem lies with the stress okay, given to the various uh, parts of a word. So, accent has to do with stress okay, and how you utter a word. Now, all of us are not uh, native English speakers. So, our speech will have the impact of our own mother tongue, which we often use for communicating at home and with friends. But the point is the uh, accent should not be such that other people are not able to follow you. So, accent is very, very important. So, one must learn to uh, use the proper accent. Similarly, there was a comment that a particular speaker spoke very fast. So, what does it mean? It means that the person did not give pause okay, between sentences or between words and that is why it can make uh, it difficult to understand ideas particularly if the ideas are profound then this matters a lot. So, in fact, there is a uh, guideline for uh, good teaching and the guideline says that think fast, but speak slowly. So, we should not think fast, we must give pauses and pauses at the right place. Now, the next important issue is attention span. Attention span of the audience uh, research shows that it is as follows initial 20 minutes of concentration lapse for 10 to 20 minutes and then slight recovery and then renewed relapse till the end. So, what this means is you can hold the attention of the audience for only 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, if that is so, all our classes uh, are 50 minutes to 1 hour duration and it is really a challenge to hold the attention of people for this long. For instance, we are having 1 and half hour sessions okay, and one and half, it is not very easy to listen to someone for that long a time. In fact, that is why uh, it is suggested that we should have frequent interactions in the class to break the monotony. Okay? And similarly, the uh, speaker has to uh, use certain techniques like you know uh, listed here. The attention span can be increased by adding variety to the talk. So, interaction diagrams, audio visuals, varying the pace of speech, pitch of the voice, length of sentence. So, you can use a short sentence followed by a long sentence and so on. So, all sentences should not be of the same length, pauses, repetition, gesturing with hands and some humor. So, these are all the various methods by which you can uh, increase the attention span. So, please pay particular attention to each of the words that are uh, listed here and if you want to improve your teaching, your communication, then please uh, tick whether you are using all these uh, means for increasing the attention span in your class such as interaction, are you having frequent interactions, uh, are you using diagrams. Someone said that the slides did not have any diagrams, right? the presentation lacked diagrams. So, are you using audio visuals, uh, are you wearing the pitch of your voice and so on. 
are you using gestures or do you stand and uh, hold your hands close to your body and then remain like that, right? And occasionally are you uh, cracking jokes and things like that. So, let us continue from where we left. Uh, we talked about the attention span uh, and how to improve the attention span. And uh, before this, we uh, spoke about effectiveness in communication, how it is related to the uh, arrangement of words and how it is not so much dependent on the uh, choice of uh, or rather uh, on the grammar of the language, but it more on how you uh, vividly you communicate the your idea. And then we also uh, gave some examples of how communication becomes inefficient when instead of using a single word, you uh, use a number of words for uh, communicating the same idea. Okay. Uh, after the attention span, now let us explain the uh, role of various uh, features of oral communication. So, we said that 55 percent of oral communication, the impact in oral communication depends on facial expression and uh, gestures, uh, hand gestures and body language and so on. So, 55 percent is non-verbal. Out of the verbal part, uh, about 38 percent is vocal. So, where we said pause, stress and intonation are important. So, here is some description of these three features. So, the pause it gives prominence to a word by isolation, it raises suspense. So, if you use a pause you can raise the suspense of the audience. Sometimes of course, if the pause is too long it may be caused by nervousness and memory lapse. So, uh, that is a negative feature. So, you must not pause for a long uh, time but you must pause maybe uh, between words occasionally to emphasize some word or between sentences definitely. Stress. Now, within sentences each word is not of equal earth shattering importance. Nouns and verbs receive more stress than adjectives and adverbs. And then we give an example of how accent is very, very important in uh, effective communication. Intonation, a variation of pitch conveying subtleties of meaning should be connected with the thoughts and attitudes of a speaker. So, uh, your variation should be appropriate to the idea which you are communicating. For instance, in one of our uh, uh, presentations that we had in the morning, um, it was pointed out that in some cases the slide, the material on the slide and what was talked about there was a disconnect between the two and that caused some irritation. Similarly, if the intonation of your speech is not in accordance with the emotion that you are trying to communicate or the idea you are trying to communicate, then this can be irritating to the audience. Um, some more aspects of nonverbal behavior, a very important uh, feature is that if verbal messages and nonverbal behavior are contradictory, audience gives more weight to the nonverbal message. This is very, very important. Okay? So, uh, let me give a practical uh, example of this uh, from my own experience. The first time I went outside India, uh, it happened to be Germany. And uh, after I landed from uh, my aircraft, my German host took me to a uh, hotel, a restaurant for some refreshment. And then, uh, in fact, I had not met my host earlier. Okay, we had only exchanged emails before that. So, that was the first occasion when we were face to face. Uh, after about 5 minutes of uh, exchanges, informal exchanges, uh, my German host uh, asked me a question. He said, uh, Shripad, uh, please do not uh, feel hurt, but I am uh, asking a personal question. So, I was wondering what personal question could it be. He said that, uh, you know, when you nod your head, I cannot figure out whether you are agreeing with me or disagreeing with me. No, I was surprised. So, what I, I never face such a difficulty with anyone here in India. So, I asked him, uh, so uh, please tell me uh, how do I express my agreement? If let us say I was a German, how would I express my agreement or disagreement? So, he said if you wanted to say yes, you will nod your head vertically. So, if you do it like this, then it means yes. On the other hand, if you want to say no, then you nod horizontally, right? So, perfect horizontal movement it means no 
and perfect vertical movement means yes. So, he said uh, I am not able to connect to you because when you nod your head you know you sometimes do this. So, I do not know whether it means uh, yes or no. Now, this was a, a very revealing experience to me and uh, it con conveys very effectively how body language or non-verbal behavior is, is more important than uh, the words you choose. So, in terms of my words I was using the right words to express my agreement or you know yes saying yes or no, but somehow my uh, non-verbal behavior in this particular case the nodding of my head. Uh, if I was in India there would not be any problem. So, uh, it is not that we must nod the head like the Germans do that is not what I am saying. What I am saying is that the body language plays an important role and in fact it dominates over the words you speak when you interact uh, when you do interpersonal communication. So, then some other issues like proximity and orientation are uh, indicated in the slide. Uh, uh, relative, relative position of speakers it matters a lot. Uh, in the presentations uh, done uh, just after lunch uh, one feedback was that in some cases the uh, person was not facing the audience and it did not seem to make eye contact. So, it is important that you position yourself properly with respect to the audience. So, for instance now since I have to face the camera because I have to address the uh, audience remote audience I am not looking at the uh, people who are sitting here on both sides and so I am not making any eye contact with them. So, I am sure they, they are missing out on the eye contact right. So, this is very important we must look at the speakers when we are uh, making eye contact and you must position yourself properly. So, some positions are indicated here normally in formal communication uh, facing each other is the best possible position ok. This is what you must follow. So, for instance it is not good in a formal com communication like uh, speaking at a conference and so on or teaching where your audience is to your side. So, let us say you are the speaker here and the audience is sitting here this is not a good uh, arrangement, but for informal communication this can be good. In fact, for informal communication two people sitting side by side or horizontal communication between people of the same status this is the best. If you want to uh, engage in communication uh, in which you would like to uh, maintain the same status between the two people who are communicating then this is the best position and this is the worst for that kind of a situation ok. Facing each other is not good normally in this cases one person is the boss and the other person is the subordinate that is the meaning. Now, here are some more points uh, on non-verbal behavior which are important. You can uh, go through these aspects in the slide because they are available with you. I will not, I uh, will just skip uh, necessary aspects of talk. It should be audible, visible, lucid and interesting. Now, how do you make your talk lucid and interesting? And you know it is, uh, for instance you must be audible. Now, in conferences many times when students are asking questions, uh, students or researchers they are asking questions they do not take care of this aspect and this can be uh, very distracting. For instance, people sitting in the audience in their own place they do not get up so they do not become visible and then uh, they are speaking into a mic and they do not take care to hold the mic close to them. So, they are not audible. So, this is an example where people do not take care to make themselves visible and audible. To make a talk lucid and interesting it is very important to introduce the subject properly. So, introduction is a very important part of your talk you must spend sufficient time in introducing the idea in an interesting manner. Lucidity depends on structure and organization, interest depends on contents whether you are using facts, concepts, principles, procedures and all these different aspects ok in your talk. Uh, some of the other points I have uh, explained already earlier. Now, uh, here are some more uh, guidelines for conference presentation you can uh, go through them they are self explanatory. Uh, what is important here is planning is a must supposing you are going to make a 20 minute presentation at a conference uh, you must uh, give that talk to yourself at least two or three times and maybe at least once to uh, a mock audience ok before you make the actual presentation. Your title should be short and catchy. So, this is also important. 
here are some uh, more uh, things to be taken care of about slides. Uh, there should not be too many slides. So, I found in the morning that uh, not in the morning, the afternoon session that uh, you uh, the, all the three presentations which were made, uh, they had the appropriate number of slides. So, on this count, uh, all the presentations were following the correct guideline about one slide a minute roughly. Now, color. Now, this is where there was a feedback about one of the presentations that the choice of color was not proper. So, for instance, using red color text in a black background is a poor combination, the contrast is very poor. Okay. So, if you choose a dark background, you must use a light lettering. For instance, in this case, I have a dark background blue, the lettering is in white, so contrast is uh, clear or a light yellow. But you should not use a dark background and a dark color text, then it is not clear. Choice of the font, 24 uh, point aerial font is what is suggested. References, now it is a good practice in oral uh, PowerPoint presentations to provide the reference right at the bottom of the slide, okay? because it does not make sense to provide the references at the end. It is not clear when you provide references at the end, which part of the talk is using which reference. Okay? In a paper, it is quite okay to provide references at the end, because I can always flip pages and then whenever I, uh, you know, somewhere I come across reference number 1, I can flip pages and go to reference number 1 and see which reference are you talking about. But in an oral presentation, that is not possible. So, the uh, reference should be provided at the bottom of the slide. Also, it may not, it is not possible to provide all details of the reference. For example, you can uh, use the name of the first author, the year of presentation, the journal. Okay, these details you can provide. It may not be possible to provide the title because you know the it may take up space. And if more details are to be given, then those can be given at the end. Uh, uh, this slide is about answering questions and so on. You can uh, this is self-explanatory. Uh, you can go through this material yourself. Now, some prescriptions how to improve communication skills, oral communication. So, read aloud a newspaper for 10 minutes. It is somewhat equivalent to practicing uh, music. Right? It is suggested if you are a vocalist for example, you must practice for some amount of time, sing daily. Now, similarly, if you want to improve your oral communication, then you must read a newspaper aloud for 10 minutes. Now, uh, what is, uh, why a newspaper, why not a book? The point is in oral communication, as far as possible, uh, you are asked to, um, you are, uh, it is suggested that you use short sentences. Okay? Only for variety occasionally you can put in long sentences, but otherwise it is not a good idea to use long sentences. So, newspapers normally follow this kind of style, since uh, the main purpose of a newspaper is readability by a wide variety of uh, uh, wide audience. Okay? So, that language is very appropriate for oral communication. So, some of the other suggestions are given here, uh, you can go through them. So, this assignment was already done in the morning, 10 minute oral presentation and feedback on that. Let me make uh, a few points on writing. So, in fact, uh, this is true about uh, not only writing, but oral communication also. Uh, that there is a link between communication and thinking. In writing, this comes out very, uh, very strongly. So, uh, Professor Sukhat may, for instance, uh, mentioned uh, during his talk that you must uh, give seminars and so on, you must exchange ideas, uh, you must uh, talk about your work to others and in the process, you will gain some new ideas. So, like that while writing your own work, you can get new ideas. So, here are a few points that have been based on research done on writing and thought. So, writing is the means of discovering new knowledge. Writing makes people think about their work in a different way. The only time when we think is when we write. In fact, some people have said that only time we think, this is not really true, this is an exaggeration, but still uh, probably it is uh, made to make a point to bring out the connection between writing and thought. And a lot is written when little has been achieved. So, if you are writing uh, too long, then 
nothing has been achieved and you are somehow trying to filling space. So, uh, some uh, guidelines on uh, what kind of font to choose and uh, whether you should justify or not and things like that uh, is self explanatory. Uh, one thing that I want to uh, focus on is the emphasis. Sometimes, some uh, people who write tend to use too much of emphasis. This is an example of using too much emphasis, right. Normally, uh, means of providing emphasis are using an underline or using bold letters or using italics or you know inserting a word between two stars, uh, two sets of stars. Now, you can, you can use any one of these methods, not all of them, right. Too much of emphasis is not good. So, this is again about uh, effort that should be spent in uh, choosing the titles of your thesis chapters and subsections and so on. Uh, please go through uh, this material. Now, writing methodology. So, there are two broadly two methodologies plan and write and think as you write. So, some people want to plan out in their mind a complete uh, an outline of what they are going to write and only then they start writing. On the other hand, some other people feel more comfortable to uh, think as you write. So, you write and then you think and then you write and so on. Now, uh, many times students get into this trap that they feel that they must spend lot of time planning their writing and as a result they go on postponing the writing towards the end. So, my suggestion to students is you just start with the second mode. Okay, if you have any difficulty, you do not feel like uh, starting off writing and you are procrastinating then you use this technique, you just start writing something uh, about the work that you want to write and as you go along, you know you can go on modifying. References, now this is one thing that uh, often uh, students do not take care of, A reference should contain uh, several pieces of information. First is the names of authors, then the title of the paper, then the journal okay, and uh, which volume and page number and which month. Now, the order in which this information has to be provided can be different for different journals. So, each journal has uh, its own uh, format, but please note that all these details are important. Some journals do not require you to provide the title. Okay? In that case, you can avoid it, but please take care to uh, reference your work properly. Broadly, there are two types uh, of referencing, uh, one in which you number the references, this is numbering scheme and second one is alphabetical scheme where the last name of the first author and the first word, uh, first letter of that name is taken as taken for sequencing. Okay? So, in such a case, uh, you must uh, reorder the name uh, as the last name followed by the first name. Okay? So, in this scheme for instance, uh, it is not correct to put the first name here first and then the last name, the last name comes first. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages of each of these uh, schemes. Uh, advantage of a scheme like this in which you use an alphabet is that when you write your thesis as and when you want to insert references, you can uh, go on doing this right. And after writing, if you want to go back and uh, you know insert a few more references, this, this sort of an iteration can be done very easily with this scheme. Uh, if you use a numbering scheme on the other hand, if you want to insert a reference, then all the numbers, subsequent numbers have to be changed. So, that is one of the difficulties, but of course, nowadays softwares are available which do this automatically. So, uh, morning I talked to you about graphs. These are the various uh, forms of graphs that are available. You can use them in illustrations. Okay? You can go in through this and in internet, you can put these words to see what kind of graphs they imply. Now, one important thing is uh, correcting your written reports to uh, make it free of errors. Okay? So, this is uh, something very, very important. Uh, many students falter uh, on this count. So, they are not able to locate uh, spelling mistakes and uh, uh, commas and full stop, they do not put at proper places. Now, the difficulty is that even when they go through their rep uh, reports a number of times, they are not able to locate the mistakes. Now, where is the problem? The problem is what is indicated here, you must achieve a psychological distance between your work, uh, your, yourself and the, your writing. So, if you are too much, uh, we always get involved when we write out something and when you are involved in it, 
you cannot locate faults okay you cannot locate mistakes so there should be some distance created between uh, the your written work and yourself only then you can objectively look at the errors now there are several ways of uh, creating the psychological distance one is that you must write uh, your work and then set it aside for a few days okay to come out of that and do something else and then you take a relook maybe after a week or 10 days then you will be able to locate the uh, faults easily another very easy method of locating mistakes is this which is uh, very effective and i have myself found it very effective uh, you read aloud what you have written as hearing reveals the difference between what you intended to say and what you actually said so when you read aloud your work you can locate mistakes grammatical mistakes and other mistakes very easily if some words are missing and so on these things show up so here are some prescriptions to improve uh, your writing so read the editorial of newspapers daily the editorials of newspapers uh, can, um, are important because they express different ideas and in depth the expressions are normally uh, are in depth and uh, also they are of certain standard so the language used there is something very appropriate for thesis writing while uh, the language used in newspaper reporting other than editorial portions is quite appropriate for oral communication for written communication it is the editorials that are good and you must practice writing for a couple of hours every week so these are some assignments uh, that are given um, i want to remind you that uh, beginning of uh, my lecture i had mentioned that we are going to have a group discussion on you and your research this article by richard hamming so i hope uh, you have located this article on the internet uh, either the original article or the complete text uh, the text of the complete talk or an abridged version of it now uh, you can write a summary you can attempt to write a summary of this so tomorrow when you come for a uh, group discussion please summarize your points in a short form right you can use this as an exercise so writing summary of uh, things that you read up is a good assignment to improve your written communication then there are some more assignments for uh, references and so on preparing figures and references okay so with this we come to the end of uh communication skills um uh, i would like to uh, have interaction with a couple of institutions on whatever we did on communication skills yes sarva machinery institute of technology and science patancheru uh, does anyone have any comment or questions here here we have already uh, discussed on the topic pertaining to the presentation uh, of our uh, communication particularly effective when we go we have to go through the newspapers editorials so we find that the editorials are in a continuous fashion generally they run in the form of a complex and compound sentences starting from the uh, one single point till the end of it but the thoughts will definitely flow in direction as you suggested it is a thought simultaneous writing activity but whereas when we come to the research while presenting i think i would like to have little details how this could be implemented thank you um uh, see uh, let me see what best i can make out of your uh, question right what you are saying is that uh, the sentences used in editorials are complex right and you feel that uh, they may not this language used in editorials may not be appropriate for uh, writing research papers i uh, see uh, as i said that the non editorial portions where news reporting is done those that language is appropriate for oral communication right for oral communication i am not saying editorial language is appropriate but for written communication because uh, generally editorials express an idea in detail right this is something this is something different from news reporting where facts are uh, you know presented 
in terms of short sentences whereas the editorials are expressing an idea okay so that is why that language uh, and uh, the way things are written uh, that is more appropriate for writing thesis where also you are expressing your ideas in a written form so the editorial language is appropriate even though sometimes uh, they use uh, some complex or compound sentences well in thesis occasionally you can use such uh, sentences because they may be required to express the idea properly yes uh, dk tes ichal karanji any comment or question uh, what i have seen is that the um, thesis when writing the thesis many people are using so many capital words or so many words where the first letter is capitalized whereas it is not required will you please uh, uh, explain on this aspect whether it is correct or not for example if i am from the textile discipline wherever i find the word textile uh, i will try to make it t capital whether that is correct or not um, i think on these guidelines are very clear that uh, if you are using names of contributors then you use a capital uh, first letter is capital similarly the starting of the sentence first letter is capital okay and only occasionally if you want to give emphasis then you use capital uh, words in capital okay now evidently you would not like to emphasize every word or uh, uh, you would not like to give uh, too much emphasis if in fact if you use uh, if you try to emphasize too many words then uh, uh, things do will not get emphasized right because you get an emphasis if something is contrasted with reference to the background then whatever is different then that gets emphasis if you use capital letters as a matter of routine then uh, you know you will not be able to emphasize so evidently that is not the correct uh, good uh, practice thank you another question is that uh, when the thesis book is written then the there is some limitation that we have to leave the spaces at the four margins i want to say margins is there any norm for that for top bottom left side and right side this is one thing another thing is that when we write the thesis at the end the people go on adding the appendices in which they add all the uh, analysis statistical analysis which is done and that run into uh, hundreds of pages is that necessary third question is that uh, how much is it justified to add the tables of anova uh, analysis in the resultant discussion thank you over to you sir okay now uh, see uh, let me uh, take up your first thing margins on these guidelines are readily available okay in fact if you take your uh, uh, there is a default uh, margin setting already in uh, the uh, word files of the uh, when we write on the computer when you use the computer to prepare a document okay um, so yes some guidelines are there you can actually look into these guidelines you uh, take a example thesis from any of the institutes like iit or iits and so on they have put up the guidelines for thesis writing on the internet okay you can use them for uh, deciding things like uh, margins and so on now coming to the appendix part see uh, what is it that is pushed in the uh, to the appendix now supposing you have a very detailed derivation of an equation then uh, you would like to give the important steps okay in the main part main body of your thesis because it is important steps uh, some key steps are important right all the details may not be that important to appreciate the idea on the other hand someone who is looking at your thesis in detail may like to go through the derivation and actually check whether the derivation is correct or or, or use the same derivation method in his or her own work so in such a case the detailed derivation is also important for some people who are looking at your work in uh, detail so for their benefit normally in the appendix you uh, you know provide the detailed derivation so this is how normally appendix appendices are chosen okay so uh, you give the key uh, key ideas or key chain of reasoning in the main body of your text about anything and then uh, if there are some finer details which they may be important for some people who are looking at your work in in depth then for their benefit you must provide the appendix 
Now, whether the appendix runs into tens of pages or hundreds, I do not think any thesis can run into hundreds of pages. In fact, nowadays, uh, your thesis is not, I do not find thesis more than about 150 or you know to 200 pages. Now, it depends in your area, I do not know what is the uh, kind of guideline okay, for thesis writing or what forms of thesis you get. Uh, I am talking about thesis in engineering, which I have reviewed or even in sciences, physics, uh, chemistry and so on. Uh, in humanities, I do not know and uh, your question is related to statistics, your other questions okay. and even your uh, the kind of content you mentioned for the appendix also is related to statistics. Okay. Now, uh, I uh, probably cannot answer that question because I am not so conversant with that uh, particular aspect, right. If you are trying to give those details, how long, how many pages should it run into, uh, you could direct that question to some other uh, speaker, right, who is going to discuss about use of statistics in uh, research. So, the last part I think I will just uh, leave it to someone else. Indore Institute of Engineering and Technology, Medak. Sir, I have a question. Like when we are preparing slides uh, for presentation, if we have too much of mathematics to, to be shown on the slides, uh, how efficiently and effectively can uh, project it on the slide? Like in cases we have too much of mathematics we pre presented, and and in and in few cases, image processing and all, there we talk more about uh, application uh, rather than in uh, base pres image uh, recognition. Okay, I think I have got your question. Uh, your question is taking ti um, time for me to reach, but I got the gist of your question. You are asking about the use of mathematics or mathematical equations in slides. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let me take this opportunity. So, use of uh, equations in slides. Uh, you see, audience cannot follow uh, mathematical derivations which are shown on the slide in detail. Similarly, if there is too much of text also, then uh, it is difficult for audience to read because uh, they have to listen to you while they are reading on the slide. Now, that is not possible. Therefore, slides should only contain minimum amount of text and minimum number of equations. Even if your work is mathematical, you put the key ideas and spend more time explaining your equations, those few equations which you are putting. Generally, it is suggested that uh, you must use uh, illustrations very liberally in your slides. In fact, I mean as, as an extreme example, a PowerPoint presentation can consist of only illustrations and diagrams, even that would be fine. But the other extreme where you have no illustrations and only text or only equations is completely unacceptable. Okay, so, for instance, uh, one of the comments about presentations, one of the presentations in the morning was it had lot of text and it had only text, no diagrams. Okay. On the other hand, you must try to express uh, your slide should contain diagrams to illustrate ideas. This the audience uh, does not find distracting and in fact, it is quite uh, illustrative and uh, it facilitates their understanding. Okay. So, uh, to summarize text and equations, they should be used minimally. Okay. And the second thing is when you write equations, uh, take care that the all the symbols used in the equations are visible. Okay. So, you must uh, use an appropriate font or uh, you know enlarge the equation to sufficient extent so that you can, uh, all symbols are very clear. NIT Kurukshetra. Uh, I want to ask about uh, the use of active and passive voice in com in communication. In the first lecture also, uh, Mr. Sukhathamai told that uh, in commonly in engineering we use passive voice, but actually I found in most of the uh, Western recommendations of people who are writing in journals that the active voice is more crisp. You should prefer to use that. So, what's your take about that? In fact, uh, I had a slide on the vo voice to be used, whether it should be active or passive. But I removed the slide because 
my recommendation was in contrast to recommendation given by professor sukatme in the mon in the first talk so you are right that uh, there is a difference of opinion generally traditionally people have preferred passive voice okay but the younger lot and the uh, more recent recommendation as far as the expression of language is concerned they suggest that uh, you use active voice because then the sentences are shorter okay and uh, it is believed that you know idea is communicated much more directly so uh, increasingly the use of active voice is uh, becoming more popular and i have also seen uh, rec this recommendation in most recent books on communication that you must use active voice even in uh, uh, papers that i have reviewed i have seen recommendations by other reviewers where they have recommended the uh, use of active voice rather than passive voice but i have not seen the other way around that is uh, reviewers recommending passive voice in fact i have seen negative recommendations saying that you know the paper uses uh, too much of passive voice and so it makes it difficult to uh, grasp the ideas presented there okay so so you can do uh, you know you can take the recommendations professor sukat may said that passive voice probably is preferred but uh, latest uh, recommendations are use active voice perumal manivekalai college yeah this is a question about registration of phd or applying phd whether the person is advisable or suggest to register phd which will complete in time whether uh, any pre work has to be done before registration or what are all the problems which is faced by the researchers uh, before, without any pre work this is my question uh, let me reframe uh, what what you have said you want to know whether uh, there is any preparation required before registering for a phd so that you will complete your phd in time well according to uh, the uh, guidelines for giving a degree the research work that you have carried out for which you want to get a phd degree should actually be done after registration you understand so um, now this question is uh, a little bit tricky one because um, we are already saying that uh, before you register for a phd you should be a post graduate mtech or msc right so there we have already uh, specified the uh, level of preparation required so um, all that i can say is uh, the only uh, preparation is motivation i think i would put it like that if you are not motivated for uh, doing a phd then um, you will not complete it in time okay so this is very important please check whether you have a strong motivation for doing phd and i have already explained what is meant by a strong motivation if it is a motivation for just gaining promotion or something the motivation is not strong enough right so unless you are in, uh, interested in the technical material right intellectual uh, challenge doing something new if you have some interest in it like people are interested in music okay they are interested in music they are, they listen to songs and so on they spend time on music because it gives them satisfaction right not because they earn money by listening to songs similarly you must have a motivation you must enjoy doing research generating ideas so i would say that is a preparation that is required otherwise all other things uh, choice of a problem choice of an area okay uh, to work on all these things happen after registration the only other thing i would like to say is uh, please uh, do some ground work to uh, choose a good institution and uh, an active researcher as a guide okay so there i think you should do some uh, background work before registering because when you register you register under a guide so apart from motivation i would say that uh, take special care to find out what kind of work is going on in the institution that you want to register and uh, the person under whom you want to register this is important our audience sir so good evening sir i am mr anandan from engineer permal manmari college of engineering osur i am a research scholar i have completed my course work my area is the nano technology so in our india there is no possibility to finding the nano research sir pardon most of the people are telling there is not available for machines and laboratories sir this is my question so can you please so my area is nano machining sir 
data deal i find uh, all the problem sir but i can't do for uh, experimental setup experimental setup uh, yes now i what i would say is you choose an area in which uh, this sort of problem is not there right if you if you are uh, restricting yourself to a particular area then this problem will be there why do you want to do only nano machining why can't you uh, you know do something else um in which a person like you with all the constraints can do some intellectual work yeah it is not necessary to be uh, fascinated by um you know an area and only stick to that certain institutions may have facilities there uh, they may be uh, you know doing research in uh, some areas which require lot of facilities same work may it may not be possible to do for some other person in a different institution so uh, there is uh, it, that is not a that much of a problem in the sense you can always choose an area okay in which you can do some new contribution you understand so please uh, i would suggest that you uh, spend some time in uh, appreciating that how uh, contributions are made in research what are the different forms of contribution what are the different areas in which contributions can be made okay so this uh, uh, survey you must do while reading the news uh, while reading uh, journal papers and so on you can get an idea about this and you uh, locate some good journal papers out of them you uh, find out those papers in which the kind of work that has been done has required uh, minimum amount of facilities expensive facilities and then you can do uh, choose that kind of a problem to work on so you should spend time in doing literature survey and uh, different types of problems that have been solved okay i would uh, suggest that yes sir one more question sir we are from the same college yeah the criteria varies from university to university in india sir for doing the research, for doing the research work phd to get the phd is it possible for government of india to form a general criteria for all the universities no i think the uh, you, uh, see uh, it is like this what is the meaning of a phd thesis uh, it has been given in so many words right what is it that constitutes a thesis so that is sufficient uh, for all universities uh, the uh, uh, quality of research has to be uh, more or less of a good standard right otherwise because it's after all a phd this is the final education degree that one gets unlike btech or mtech so uh, whether a government can formulate an area uh, such a thing or not is uh, is not something that i can answer it is for the government to say but uh, we can always have guidelines for ourselves so what you can do is uh, take up an institution like iit which is in india right and see what criteria they are using for awarding phd degrees that can be a reference for you you try to uh, maintain similar criteria for doing your research yes you have some more constraints i i understand that so uh, probably some uh, dilution uh, may be acceptable but not beyond a limit for instance in uh, iit uh, you should have at least two good journal publications if you want to submit a phd thesis this is uh, broadly the criterion that is used now in your case maybe we can reduce it to one good journal publication and maybe a few conference publications right but it cannot be no journal publications i think that would not be a good uh, standard anywhere in any university so a reviewed peer reviewed journal publication is important where a review process is good merely conference publications uh, ordinary conference publications cannot be uh, guidelines for uh, cannot be uh, sufficient criteria for phd yes, i am asking just why can't we follow a general criteria throughout india it varies from university to university no. Uh, see uh, yes i understand now can you tell me an example of a common criterion that can be followed i think this is sufficiently common right i have said two good journal publications or at least one good journal publication and um, few conference publications for outside uh, non iit or non iisc you know which are not centers of excellence institutions of excellence i think that is a good enough common criterion see as far as the period is concerned um the only problem with the period is with the it has to, to do with the scholarship right so that is why the, what the government is saying is it has decided it will give some amount of money for doing research and you divide that money in to the number of years and give the scholarship accordingly 
right so you want to take longer fine your money is going to be spread over a longer period okay some amount of money is is fixed i think that is a reasonable criterion because money is an issue after all another thing you should note is that if the you take too long to do your research problem then there are uh, then you may not be able to produce a thesis for several reasons one is you have started on some problem and you know the progress is happening at an advance uh, at a rapid pace so the kind of problem you have taken may become irrelevant if you take too long to submit your thesis that is one issue if you take too long another thing is you may not be able to sustain your interest for very long so therefore normally the guidelines are that you complete your research between uh, within 4 to 6 years i think more than that you should not take okay so now i think we will uh, uh, halt our uh, discussions